All right, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to invite a few people forward. Don't worry. If, uh, 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 as I introduce you folks, you just come on up forward and have a seat to uh, share some reflections on the past and the development of, uh, of, of Christian uh, faith-based um, uh, social justice advocacy. So first we have Jim Visser. Jim uh, told me to tell you that he's the oldest guy in the room. Uh, he's a professional artist, um, and if you haven't seen his work, um, there's some of it around uh, Kings, uh, and all of it is amazing and beautiful. Uh, Jim was uh, there right from the beginning, from the founding. In 1962, he was a uh, founding uh, member of the Christian Action Foundation, which eventually gave birth to CPJ. He was a board member for CPJ uh, on a number of different occasions. He also edited the Vanguard magazine that... Um, for a long time, some of you may have memories back there. I think he actually brought a few uh, copies of, uh, of it for folks to peruse. It is a fascinating uh, insight into uh, a really crucial and formative time. So Jim, if you can come on up. Um, and we also have Marty Patrick. Uh, Marty Patrick is a professor of education here at the King's University. Um, she uh, worked uh, in the BC office of CBJ when there was such a thing, from 1988 to 1991, uh, when she was fresh out of Calvin College with a degree in history and poli sci. Um, she uh, currently, besides her work as a professor of education, uh, is, is uh, important leader, uh, offering important leadership and organization working on civic religious literacy, which is um, a crucial need, and she's done a lot of research and work, uh, including active campaigning, on helping um, teachers and educators talk about religion um, uh, honestly and without fear uh, in a world where that's a touchy and difficult thing to do. So come on up, Mark. John Heemstra. Uh, John Heemstra is a uh, professor emeritus of, poli uh, of political science uh, at the King's University. Um, John was on the national board of CPJ in 1979, um, back when he was still a graduate student in Toronto, um, after which he worked for six years for CPJ at its Calgary office. Um, uh, he took a leave from, uh, from that after six years to complete his PhD in, in, in policy and political theory uh, at the University of Calgary. He was offered the option to return to CPJ upon completing that, um, but I am personally grateful that he didn't do that because he took up a position uh, teaching politics here at King's. So come on up, John. And we have Annie McKittrick. Annie uh, has worked on uh, both sides of uh, uh, faith-based social justice advocacy. So both doing a lot of different kinds of advocacy uh, on many, many different topics, but she also served uh, as the MLA for Sherwood Park um, for, uh, for a, a, fair, a relatively recent term, although that's been going away. Currently, um, she is, uh, works on cycling safety and uh, advocacy. Um, and is an avid and remarkable cycle. I, I see her Facebook posts about the rides she takes sometimes, and I'm like, wow, that's, yeah, I could do that. Uh, and uh, is also helping to uh, direct a French language radio station here in it. So please welcome Annie. <laughs> so, folks, if you guys could grab, so we've got two microphones to share between the group here. Because uh, we operate on a um, strict age before beauty um, principle here, uh, I'm going to ask Jim to start. <laughs> um, sorry about that, Jim. Um, what I'm going to ask each of you just to, to reflect a little bit on. You can take a little bit of time, um, but uh, starting with Jim to talk about um, what was the atmosphere um, and what was the landscape of faith-based advocacy and policy work, like as CPJ was formed and in its early years, um, and were, can you think of particular um, events, campaigns, 
moments, personalities, and so on that shaped CPJ and its work in that at, uh, in, in that atmosphere as it developed. So, Jim, take it away. Tell us a few things. Well, I'll try it. Um, well, going back to the early 60s, uh, just mentioning that uh, this time was the time of John Kennedy, it was the time of John Diefenbaker, it was a time when this uh, kid from Minnesota sang Blowing in the Wind, and the times they are changing. And here we were, and I'll, I'll just bring myself into this personally. Um, my family were dedicated, uh, devout Christian immigrants from Holland. We came in 1947 when I was eight years old. And we um, grew up in the devout Christian manner uh, in, in the Kaiparian tradition. And as time unfolded, I wondered how this would manifest itself in myself. Um, tragically, my father passed away when I was uh, in, uh, I was 20 years old, but at the age of 19, with my younger brother, we already had to take over the farm while my friends were going on to university. But I was formed, you know, at that time because of the many discussions I've had with dear friends, such as John Othius, Andrew Wieringa, Mark's father, who was a dear friend of mine. And we had, uh, my wife and I, we attended the Kelvin Club, which was formed at that time by Paul Scrutenboer. And this was a formative time for me for developing a Christian vision. And soon after that, there was the time when Louis Tamiga, Andrew Waring, John Altius, myself, and a few others formed the Christian Action Foundation. And it was formed out of uh, the Western Christian Labor Association, which really was a society. Uh, because this was formed, this was an association prior to the CLSC as we knew it as it was formed soon afterward. And the membership of the CLA, the CLA in Western Canada uh, agreed that we would take over that membership into the Christian Action Foundation. And the Christian Action Foundation became a vehicle where we did a variety of things. We published the Vanguard, a Christian a small myth magazine, I should hold it up for you. Uh, and this uh, was about um, 10 times a year, and we did this by ourselves. I remember, you know, this thing was typeset with the old-fashioned way. We string galleys off of our living room or our kitchen wall and cut it down into pieces and do the layout and bring it back to the printers and we bring in some visuals and uh, so, and in those days, we corresponded from Edmonton to Toronto, not with emails, snail mail. We typed our letters in, uh, with an Underwood typewriter, with a, <coughs> a, a copy uh, paper, and uh, that's, that's, and then we waited for <coughs> at least a week for a response. So that's how we worked. But anyway, um, you know, um, as at that time, uh, the Christian Action Foundation would, at election times, conduct citywide all candidate forums. We formed a high school students club to discuss Christian social action. Uh, we organized inspirational speeches from time to time, and we addressed the issues of pluralism in education. And that became a success because with John Altius and Andrew Weir's initial input, we uh, persuaded um, a few of the MLAs to, to uh, form a private member's bill. 
uh, which uh, eventually in 1966 led to uh, a $100 per student grant for independent schools. And this was done in the, not in the sense of uh, lobbying for self-interest, this was done because we included other schools. It was for the, so if, for instance, the Jewish schools were also included. And uh, so this was a significant uh, development. So Vanguard was uh, emailed free of charge to all MLAs and people that we felt were in leadership positions. And at that time, um, tragically, we lost Andrew, and John Malthus carried on. He was only 25 years old when, in 1967, he said he was asked to move to Toronto to take on part-time leadership of the uh, early ICS. And that left me with, uh, uh, to carry on the Vanguard. So I um, took it upon myself to invite people to write uh, and to compile, with the help of some other friends, the uh, monthly issues. And I kept that up, and I also took time one winter to take off from farming to travel and promote the Vanguard in Ontario and in Western Canada. At that time, uh, I must also say that Gerald Van der Zande was a, a great inspiring influence. He became a very a dear personal friend of mine, and uh, he was a man who could speak with, um, off, instantaneously, at, on any occasion, with, in an inspiring manner. He was also, at that time, uh, leading the Christian Labour Association took the uh, issue of the closed shop to the courts and won eventually um, the uh, decision from the judges. I remember it was Judge McCrure who said, yes, uh, the, uh, in the, that uh, a worker, according to his religious conviction, should have the right to not be a member of a particular union. As time went on, um, it was, became clear that the Vanguard needed to go to Toronto, and which it did. Uh, I was at, on the board of the, of the uh, at that time I was serving as a board member of CPJ, and we were at a time where John Oltis proposed that we uh, address, we, we take a major step to address the Kenzie Valley pipeline. And John was able to do this uh, by persuading the board, but there was a division in the board at the time. Some of the board members said, I don't think we're ready to do this. But, uh, majority of us said, yes, we must go ahead. This, uh, I, I mentioned the division because it led to a split between the CLA and the CPJ, which we still see today. Uh, uh, so, so there was a value split that, that was that's ongoing. These, the Christian Labor Association um, then uh, formed the Work Research Foundation, and I might mention that the Work Research Foundation expanded to what is now CARDIS, which is a successful presence in Canada. But there was, there was, there, I, and I think it's reflective for us to, to recognize that there was a value split here, which still exists today. So at that time, I was relieved of the vanguard and. Uh, I'll just go through my notes here. <coughs> so when John Oltheus obtained intervener status at the National Energy Board hearings, he was able, he challenged the, uh, the chair because the chair was uh, 
there was a conflict of interest because the chair was a, one of the uh, CEOs of a major oil company. So that was a successful challenge. And then, um, he, under his leadership, uh, we, uh, he proceeded to uh, move the, the values <laughs> forward and um, the Berger inquiry was formed and we, we could say that the CPJ could take credit for the moratorium issue, which eventually Berger recommended and the government adopted as a 10-year moratorium for the development of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline. The, the question that CPJ took on was not only just energy, valued the whole environmental impact and the First Nations impact and the, the, all the issues of justice associated with that. And I'm going to lead up to now to the mid-70s in Edmonton, because at that time, um, with the leadership of CPJ, and particularly with Gerald, Gerald was a great communicator in, with many of the churches and the uh, fellow organizations that uh, aligned with this idea. And in Edmonton, uh, in 1976, a, a major conference took place with 500 people attending in the Presbyterian Church. And this included um, representation from the Catholic bishops, from the private Catholic Church, of the Anglican Church, the heads of the Lutheran Church, of the Presbyterians, the, of the United Church, and a lot of the supportive social organizations. And at that time, John was uh, at, in the McDonald Hotel monitoring the meetings of the national uh, oil companies who were discussing their policies, and he would come back in the evening and report while we were protesting and listening to uh, one another and all these, the various speeches and doing workshops. And the Minister of Northern Affairs was in attendance. This was a major event which CPJ was responsible for organizing. So I'm going to leave it at that, as a, and because there's others who are going to talk about our history, and uh, if there's any questions later, uh, I can expand, but th that's where I'll leave it for now. Thank you very much, Jim. That's great context. Um, uh, 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 turn next, I think maybe I'll ask Annie. Uh, can I, I start asking Annie, I know you have something's prepared. When Jim had talked about that sort of divide, sort of within the Christian community, right, that sort of started, uh, that sort of, in, where you got these different, um, uh, directions, as it were, sort of represented somewhat by CPJ, somewhat by Cardis. I saw you nodding, right? That's something you've experienced. Yeah. Um, and that's, right, can you, you pick that up and follow it and just uh, tell us about the, the landscape as you've experienced it and how it's changed, too. Well, I feel I'm, I'm really the uh, outlier here because I'm church 
mission in downtown, and I was really attracted by God as a creator because I was working around um, saving whales and the creation and the creation. I was attracted to me. And I ended up, and I remember going to church wearing buttons about saving seals and this and on. And, and the minister at the time, which you probably don't know, but he's quite famous in the Baptist denomination, his name is Rod Bell, and he was very gracious and that started me on the path. Then I went to Regent College in, in Vancouver, which you probably know is, is was then one of the leading evangelical um, graduate schools, not so much for ministry, but for teaching people how to live and how to live out their, their faith in, in, in the world. And that's where I met Gerald. And I still remember, and I can't remember what he talked about, but I remember attending a lunchtime lecture. <laughs> and it may have been about freedom from, and, and education and so on, I really don't. But I, I, I remember that myself and then, then a few other people at, at Regent then, and this was, this, this was the late 70s, it was early, we started a social justice group at, at Regent and went on and on and on for years. And that was my first uh, contact with CPJ and it has remained it so since, since that time. And it was, it's, it's still very powerful for me to think what would have happened if I hadn't known that there was other Christians who were thinking theologically and Christianly about the environment and were willing to do something about it. I think that's what that has really stayed with me is the willingness to do something to change what you're doing and to commit to, to action because I've always been action oriented. Um, and, and as I moved on, and I work both in Christian and non-Christian organization, I, and, and after finishing Regent, I did go overseas and, 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 and work overseas mostly in, in um, community development. And, then, and I also work with the Mennonite Central Committee, because the Mennonite Central Committee is another organization like CPJ, which I think has really helped a lot of young people at the time to really have an idea of how you can act in the world and be in the world um, as, you, as we should all act and be. So one of the things that I realized early on in, um, in, in my career path is that thinking Christianly about what you do and how you do it became very, very important for me. So in, in, I worked as a social planner where I worked on homelessness issues and, and affordable housing issues. And one of, the, one of the challenges forever is really, when you're working in the community, is what is the role of the faith community? And I think this is, goes to Jim point of what, how, how the church is really starting to split. And while in, in the past there was agreement of how churches would be and how you would support the homeless, for example, or, or affordable housing, all the environment and so on. I found that at a point they became more of a dichotomy. So it came from what I used to like to loosely call the, the charity model versus the, the social justice model, and that it became much more comfortable for us to to think of it of an issue as something that we can give charitably than around an issue that we, we have to really reflect on how we are part of the reason why this issue and then to put both our way that we live, not just our money on, on the line. And I think that's one of the area that has really puzzled me over the last, I don't want, want to say 50 years, but close, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but close to 50 years. And that dichotomy, I have, I, have, I have seen in everything. I have seen it in, in when I was a school trustee for nine years in, in, in British Columbia and where for the first time there was both a region grad as a chair and then they won as, as the vice chair. And, and, and just in my work with the faith communities as, as a social tenor. So now I, I want to just talk a little bit about what it's like to be a politician that is engaged in those issues, which I was. When I ran for the NDP, I probably was the only uh, um, candidate or an MLA who had a very strong sense of the role of the faith communities in making our societies more our society more just. And it was a really so 
something that I really felt called to do. It's, it's who I am. I had lived that uh, overseas and in, in the communities I had worked with. And so it became very, very interesting because I was waiting for the faith community knowing that I was a Christian and that I was very engaged to come to me and say, oh, we really support what the government is doing. Look at this, you've raised the minimum wage. <laughs> or you've done this thing, you're worrying about the environment and so on. So I brought a couple of props with me just to show you what happens. But when I left, when I left my office, I was allowed to take my files. I shredded a lot of files, but I kept one, one set of files because it really for me, it was a huge indicator of how the church was not engaged in what happens in, in the community and how, as Jim said, we, there was, became a real dichotomy. So, which file do you think this is that I got? This is all the letters I got on the issue. I'll give you a guess as to what it was. Abortion. Huh? Abortion. Yeah. Abortion. GSAs and bathrooms. Mm. Okay. And I think it may be a bonus act. A bonus act. Yeah. Uh, oh, just a technical one. Yeah. yeah, there you go. And this is the file on the environment, affordable housing, <laughs> and homelessness. Okay. <laughs> and That we had as Christians and as churchgoers, and <coughs> I'm talking generally, is the only concerns that we felt that we should address government on with those issues. But we did see our role to also support, criticize, or engage government in issues that we should be engaged in, such as poverty mm -hmm. and how we live in poverty. And that has really, really. That was really influential on me, and it was it was actually at times very challenging. And so I want to go back to CPJ and my involvement in CPJ and with people at Kings. If I didn't have a supportive community that I had built because of my connections with CPJ over the years, and knowing that I wasn't by myself, that there was a lot of other Christians who thought the same and were working and were sacrificially involved in in wanting to work toward climate change, housing, poverty, immigrants. You know, when you're facing Mr. Kenny across the Legislative Assembly, and he was the one who, who stopped uh, medical benefits for refugee claimants. It's very, very hard. But knowing that I'm, I was part of an organization that had fought him on that, and with that and other faith communities had reversed his decision to stop medical, uh, to, to stop uh, refugee claimants from not getting access to federal <coughs> benefits. That really made me happy, saying that I'm not by myself in doing this. So really, one of my message to, to, to Christians, and I and, and I, really, I feel this is really important, is it's really important that you understand that politicians need to hear from you, both on positive things and negative things. But unless you speak to them directly about how your faith impacts the way that you vote and the policy decisions they want to make, then we're not going to get the kind of public policy uh, that we really want to have in our community. So I'll stop there because I have some ideas for solutions. You'll get to weigh in. Thanks very much, Anne. That's uh, it was really helpful, and, and, and I, I love to see the way you, you built that. One of the distinctive things about CPJ and other sort of related organizations and so on is, as Jim sort of narrated, made a step to say that the advocacy isn't going to be fundamentally just based on protecting or um, advancing our stuff as a Christian or the Reformed community but to um, look to the interests, concerns, and justice for others as well. It's easy for the Christian voice in the public sphere to be primarily about turf protection or about sort of trying to hold on to Christianity's 
um, domination or privilege or special voice or something like that. Um, but to have um, what's remarkable about uh, organizations like CPJ right, is the very conscious decision to say we're not just going to do that. Right? This isn't just going to be about us. We're not just being in the public sphere for our own interests, right? but for the interests of others. And that continues to be a challenge. Um, and to do that in a full-throatedly faith-based way, it's remarkable. John, can you tell us about your experiences? Okay. Yeah. Well, I have quite a few of them, and uh, I'll just keep restricted to a few of them. Mm. But uh, let me start with the atmosphere. You asked what was the atmosphere of yeah. faith-based uh, uh, advocacy for policy. And uh, in the 1960s, Canada still had what I would call largely a sort of an informal established church. That is, there was the United Church, the Anglican Church, Lutheran Church, Catholic Church, which functioned essentially as the conscience of the nation and was expected to do so. Uh, by the 60s, attendance was dropping off very rapidly. There were elements of that established model that I think are really quite bad. Christian nationalism, uh, imposing views. CDJ came onto the scene working alongside uh, what had already been established as a bunch of uh, Christian uh, church coalitions, uh, the coalition on the north, and all these sorts of things that were doing really excellent work uh, in that context. So they were the positive side of that effort. Uh, the negative side was what, in the 60s when I was a little kid, uh, you know, it was assumed Canada was Christian. That's, you know, and uh, you know, when my colleague in grade eight, Ravinder Singh, came from India, he was coming into something that was foreign to him, and he was really a part of it. Um, CPJ, in that context, fought for uh, pluralism, and in a very kind of structured sense of pluralism, <coughs> so making room structurally in public life for many voices that reflect the voices of what Canadians really are. Uh, and that, that was, uh, I, I think, CPJ's way of getting at that was unique, and I think that added something new. Um, let me throw two things into it then that I think CPJ also did, and then I'll pass it to Marty. Uh, the first is, uh, I was privileged as an opportunity to work for what became known as CPJ in Alberta, which was an affiliate. So instead of all of CPJ's energy going into national issues, uh, and once in a while treading on provincial issues as a national organization, we, we've said, let's start affiliates in each province, uh, a federal model of CPJ. And those, so we all started an office in Edmonton and in Calgary, I, I went to the Calgary office, Challenging environment, but excellent bunch of people uh, already working there. Um, and so the affiliate model then was to try to address provincial jurisdiction questions, questions that arose here. Um, and so what I want to highlight here is the richness of CPJ's public justice model, public justice framework. Um, there's a lot of documents on it uh, on, online. Um, CPJ developed at the time. But the idea was to think through what a, a faith-inspired approach to public life really should look like and what the government's role might be in that. Uh, and then try to use that then to maneuver and figure out different ways of acting on different questions. On a multitude of questions, and this is my point, we then tackled a multitude of questions uh, everything from school questions, I've got a little list here, environmental questions, we actually got the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, we did housing policy, believe it or not, don't ask me about it, it's complicated. Uh, provincial economic diversification, we did a submission to uh, Peter Lodge, you know, on that. Cultural pluralism, um, so just two examples, the South Saskatchewan River Basin Planning Program, you heard of it? No. Yeah. Uh, Yes, yes. <laughs> no water is allocated 
from the South Saskatchewan to industry and urban and uh, irrigation and environment and historical. And the whole question was, we're going to we're going to redo that as a province and open up public hearings. And so the CPG chapter. Got a bunch of people who are involved in this from agriculture done in, uh, in the south to urban people to recreation, indigenous angles. And we said, how, how should water be allocated? So we went through a whole long process, which was actually had some tension in it because the irrigation farm was one of the lot, as you can remember too. Um, and uh, so we did our presentation, and, and just as an outcome of that, one of the panelists afterwards came up to us and said, you know, you're, we appreciated your uh, submission the most of all the groups, because you are doing our work for us. You're doing public justice work. You're trying to figure out how to put all this stuff together in a just, equi equitable, stewardly way. That's what government needs to do. You guys are helping with us. And in fact, you're the only one who didn't come here asking for something. Mm. Uh, you helped us do, do, do the work. So that's CPJ's public justice framework, and I think it's extremely fruitful uh, on many issues, and we have to sort of find a way, I think, to revive that. Second example, Locust Christian School, an alternative school in the public system in Calgary. Uh, it was the very first one. So we got along with the Jewish school down there. And it came under attack, and CPJ then, in a, in a pluralistic, how do you do structural pluralism? Do justice to all and discriminate against none in education. And we joined with Logos and the Jewish school and several others to fight for a change in the, uh, the framework that the Calgary Board of Education had. Uh, they insisted on not going down that route. They closed down all the programs, including the Plains Indian Cultural Survival School. The Jewish schools got thrown out. They got saved by the Catholic schools because they don't fit in either Protestant or Catholic historically. And Logos got shut down. Uh, shortly after, Edmonton started it and has revived it and is running it well. John Hall can tell us all about that. Um, so that framework was again applied to that particular issue. Uh, that's way too long. I'm going to just dump out the other one very short which is the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline has always been a huge positive influence in how I think about things because I think it's a way of doing integrated policy. That is, instead of dividing life up into issues and tackling issues in isolation or as in silos, <coughs> the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline said there are indigenous issues, there are land claims that are unsettled. We're not sure about energy and how the South is using it. We're using piles of natural gas and oil. Should we be burning and using so much? And then environment, we don't know how the ecosystem works in the North and how the caribou will be affected by this. We divide that up today and tackle the separate issues. And what the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline did is, uh, our participation in it, is to take that as a uh, crystallization point of many issues and problems and deal with them all together. I think it's a very, very powerful way of making a point on many issues at the same time with limited resources. So the, the first one, the Alberta affiliate, took the common framework and dealt with a pile of issues. The second one, can't you know, talk about, deals with a pile of issues in one focus. Uh, I think they're both powerful. I think we should use both of them. Thank you, John. Um, during my brief time answering emails for, uh, for CPJ, one of the most common questions we would get would be, what on earth is public justice? Right? Um, because they're like, well, we think we know what social justice is. If you were a citizen for social justice, we would think we know what that is. But what is that public thing there? Right? And so what John was talking there about, keeping a clear focus and question on what's, uh, what are the broad, systematic, uh, questions of justice, how do they interrelate and what's government's role in it in ways that synthesize it. That's the, 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 one of the key and distinctive things about CPJ, being able to say that. So not simply, which is still also a good thing, to demand justice in this case, in this case, in this case, in this case, but to think coherently 
uh, and in a broader sense about the particular responsibilities and roles of faith communities, of government, and so on, and then to premise advocacy on that um, is, a, um, is again, a, a key distinctive that made that effective. Marty, um, can you say about your sort of experience? You, you were working for CPJ fresh out of, uh, out of college, right? At a very interesting time in the late 80s, early 90s. Can you, uh, can you share some of your reflections? Yeah, and just a note about public justice. It was uh, Gerald's saying always about uh, justice, not just us. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, just a little sense of what it was like working for an organization. We had a technology upgrade from the time of Jim because we had facts. So, <laughs> uh, and this was a time in which, uh, for those of you who were using computers back then, we had to do everything with auto exec dot bat or whatever that was to get our computers going. Uh, Word perfect, it was the era of Word perfect where you had to have that little card over all the F keys so you knew what all the uh, shortcuts were. Um, our paychecks were a courier to us um, and often there wasn't enough, do you remember that? There wasn't enough money. I don't know how okay. <laughs> there were those instructions and I don't know how Harry and and there wasn't enough money, so I don't know how. But they lived often off of their credit card, as they told us. And it was the era of dot matrix printers. So if you wanted to get anything printed that looked nice, you had to stop off at the at the printer and get laser printers. So it was, uh, it was uh, a different time of technology. So we were the third provincial office to be open. There were first the two Alberta offices, then the BC office, and then the Ontario office. And we were from 1987 to 1991. 1991, uh, just because of all the financial difficulties, CPJ closed down all of their provincial offices. Uh, and we had uh, two co-directors, Eric Skillport, who was a teacher, and uh, Craig Vance, who got very involved in housing policy, which is where I think Annie you first encountered him, and uh, the office that was opened overlapped with uh, the time of the last Solcred government in BC under the leadership of Premier Van Der Zandt, and that actually, he's going to figure into uh, the big project that uh, uh, CPJBC had. Uh, he was one of uh, a series of BC premiers that had to resign out of scandal back in the time when scandal did actually lead to resignations. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it coincided with the abortion issue. Uh, and BC didn't get all that involved in the issue. I don't know, John, if you did, but that was a lot out of um, uh, the central office, and Gerald worked a lot with. Brian Stiller from the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, doing a lot of work educating uh, people in the church that there is a difference and that they must distinguish between public policy and kind of uh, what happens in church and the way that uh, churches um, have kind of uh, church teaching. So that was, uh, that took up a lot of um, time uh, federally. Uh, so I came on in December of 1988 as a support staff for one day a week and then to support a project that BC had, it was called the Angelica Project, and it was funded by the Law Foundation of British Columbia. And the Angelica now called um, the Save Kai Denny First Nation. They had been displaced by the creation of the Williston Reservoir during the construction of the WAC Bennett Dam. And not only have they been displaced, but uh, the graveyards have been bulldozed over, houses have been burned down, and they had been placed into an area that, that was outside of their traditional uh, territory. And some of them had kind of migrated back to the area that they knew, but again, living conditions were horrible because there was no infrastructure there. And in 1987, uh, they had, uh, managed to get a, a minister, a, a cabinet minister, to, to fly up there and to show them the conditions under which they were living. And that began a two-year 
kind of media project by the Band Council to try to get something done. And the, the grant that CPJ got was to be in support of that and largely to carry the, the public relations side, the media side of that. So um, we worked together, we were um, a support role for the band council, put together with them uh, a 70 page history of all that had happened and sent that out to the media, um, coordinated a big media um, blitz that culminated in a public forum in downtown Vancouver, and eventually Van der Zam himself went up there and there was promise to set aside, um, I don't know if I have how many acres, um, I, but anyways, to relocate them to the northern end of the Williston Reservoir, which was back in their traditional territory, and to put a bunch of money uh, into, well, new money into new programs. And that is where they still are today. Uh, there, there still are ongoing issues and still ongoing negotiations with the provincial government. Um, but that was, uh, I think, a, a project in which uh, there were a number of uh, BC CPJ members that flew up there on a number of occasions. It was an opportunity to meet face to face and hear and see what the issues were. And I think that's what actually brought in a lot of new members into certainly the BC section. Uh, of CPJ, and it is what actually got a lot of people motivated to, to join. So when the office closed, uh, it was actually very difficult for a lot of members there. When we, when I went to the meeting uh, in Toronto, where we were going to decide whether we were going to close down the provincial offices or not, they sent me off with a whole pile of checks and said, "Here, here are the checks to show the." Uh, the big honchos there in Toronto, because we in BC have a very, you know, BC versus Central Canada kind of thing going. Um, they said, show them that we really do support this office. And yet the decision was made because uh, we, we knew what the, what the funding issues and all the financial issues were. Uh, so Willard can say what the level of support is in BC. I don't know what it was after that. Um, and uh, for the rest of the 90s, I did stay on as a board member. Uh, very recently, I met uh, Brian Walsh, who was the chair of the, uh, the, of the CPJ National Organization at the time. And he, put, he recognized me, but couldn't remember who I was, so I explained who I was. And his first, the first words of his mouth were, oh yeah, I fired you. Uh, <laughs> It's not quite what you did, but <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, um, let's see. Yeah, and you know, during my time as a board member, the one thing I did witness were the amazing people that end, that end up working for CPJ. People with incredible social policy knowledge, uh, the work that was done for refugees and refugee policy, I think by Andy Brower. Um, just the, the, the breadth and the depth of the work and the research that was done. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Margaret. That's really helpful. I, I only knew some of those stories, right? Uh, and have, you know, a very dim memory of my own of, uh, of, of the Van der Zandt regime um, and some of those issues, but, uh, but my, my memory is very dim. Over the course of this, we've seen uh, a number of interesting changes, right? Both for CPJ and for the landscape and atmosphere of faith-based um, developments, right? So we've seen um, the emergence of different kinds and new issues and new crystallizations um, of, um, of uh, also the landscape of different organizational forms and of giving um, and um, support and financial support and financial realities for, uh, for these organizations. So those are interesting changes over time. Um, just really quickly before we let, uh, I'll let you folks and everyone else have to take a break, anyone want to sort of, uh, of you want to be able to say something 
Jim, what are the key general changes you, you've seen um, uh, that sort of bring us up to more or less where we are now, right? So we've seen um, Christian churches move from uh, a sort of shadow establishment to a more minority voice. We've seen, even within the Christian community, um, a sort of a separation between um, sort of uh, a minority voice that still that takes social justice and transformation very seriously, and then uh, a lot that have, tends to be more inward focused or concerned about um, uh, maintaining Christian um, uh, privilege or uh, its historical nature. Are there particular ones that jump out at you that sort of say, well, this is kind of where we are now? Well, uh, <clears throat> the momentum from the pluralism ideal uh, out of the faith that was so strong as we originally moved forward. Um, we moved forward because it was truly personal faith amongst the leaders and in the community. Uh, after all, like you say, uh, we were the, the workers were all underpaid. I remember that clearly too, and I felt for them uh, as a board member and as a participant and a volunteer. But um, right now, we don't have as many church organizations anymore. They, I remember very much the uh, Catholic uh, Development and Peace Organization. Mm -hmm. and uh, organizations coming out of the United Church and so on. We don't see that anymore. We do see still a minority in the Christian churches who have a strong social conscience, but they are a minority. Um, and it's a challenge of CPJ to mobilize that mindset and, and to continue to press to them that we have um, an inclusive plurality approach in uh, in forming policies. Mm -hmm. So that's that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's a question that I ponder all the time. You know, mm -hmm. I, I do because I think it's really at the crux of the success of the work that CPJ and other organ organizations do. Is the um, I think because when you're talking about public policy or oh, justice in any form, you're challenging the, I want the privilege and the rights of people, of who they are and so on. And you're, you're asking them to engage in something where they have to think of the other and, 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 and that, you know, and, and I'm thinking of the discussion around harm reduction at the moment. different steps towards recovery and there's no government program that's going to be able to make somebody on the recovery path unless mm -hmm. it's the right time for them and the right conditions and so on. And so sometimes I think public, good public policy really challenges us because we would like it to be a simple thing. We would yeah. like to be able to solve the, the problems. I mean even the McKinsey pipeline, you know, was, it wasn't easily solvable. The other things that we've, we used to engage in, in, in the past and that the CPG was very successful, such, such as the refugee work and, and gaining rights against for access to health benefits. And I think that's a challenge for a lot of Christians because they have been offered by other groups a very simple solution. And harm reduction is wrong because you're facilitating some of the access to drugs and so on. And, and um, a dry recovery house and so on is the right is is the right path. And that's a much simpler answer to us. While well, really it's a complicated answer that maybe is the right answer and that might see more success in, in, in what we do. I I think it just yeah it 
just because it, it means for us to think a lot more and to be a lot more challenged in our life and our thinking. I think that's mm -hmm. what is hard. And simple answer and, and groups who offer simple answers, I think, are better communicators than we are. And I think that's one of the issues. I think we need to discuss the CPJ and people who believe in public policy is how do we communicate this and how do we engage people with the complicated answers. Yeah. You don't even have to speak to it, but if, uh, uh, John or Martin, you want to say something? I do. About this? I do. Uh, if you look around right now, uh, you know, the idea of Christian engagement of, of policy, it, the old Christian nationalist kind of idea has, I think, faded to the background. I'll say that for a moment. Uh, the idea that the as, the establishment of these key churches can, through their leadership or other ways, speak to public policy. That's faded away. The uh, Kairos is still doing good work um, and some other coalitions, but it's pretty quiet out there. Uh, and the way people tend to think is as individual Christians and engage it as individuals, which means by default, the public realm becomes secular. And secularism, as we know, is not neutral. It's going somewhere. It's about material growth. It's about individual self-fulfillment and all those sorts of things. And that secularism has led in all kinds of directions. That has led, I think, to a sort of polarized reaction. Mm -hmm. And you're getting increasing support among certain sectors of the churches for a, a revived Christian nationalism. Let's make Canada a Christian country again. In the bad sense of that. And so CPJ's structural pluralist alternative to those two uh, has had some, I think, very good impacts. I, th I think it helps lots of people with dealing with uh, faith in schools and that sort of thing. But it's under siege. Yep. And it's, so that's the first point. Second point, very quickly, is that in a society that sees itself largely as individuals who are self-fulfilling themselves, the main task of a public realm of government is to make sure there's lots of economic growth so we have lots of wealth so that we can all fulfill ourselves to the maximum, go on our trips to Mexico and all these sorts of things, because that's what it means to you. You need economic growth. And we are facing catastrophic climate change and species loss and ecosystem collapse as a consequence of that. So the de facto public policy has been economic growth for material goods so you can be individually free. That ain't working anymore. So we have the return to Christian nationalism. We have the mainstream that's still churning along that dream that's not working. And we have groups like CPJ and Kairos and others, I think we need to speak into that as there is another way of seeing all of this. And it's big, it has many pieces to it, and we need to speak into that challenge and that crisis, I think. So, uh, my very specific example, um, yeah, follows along exactly what Annie and John were saying, which is that when the provincial government released its draft curriculum in March of 2021, its social studies draft included the study of religion for the first time ever. Uh, and so in grade two, they were going to do the Abrahamic faith, and in grade five, it was going to expand to um, other faiths. And the response of the public was unbelievable in terms of there is absolutely no room in public education for the study of religion. There was no understanding about the difference of educating into religion and educating about religion. There, uh, this was very strong on social media. There were parents saying, I've given my student permission that as soon as religion comes up in the classroom, they may leave the classroom. Um, the social imaginary of these so many parents was that this is secular, everything is secular, religion is completely private. Uh, if I wanted my student to learn anything about religion, I would have sent them to the Catholic system. Um, so this is all becoming much more difficult. The landscape is shifting, and uh, it is silent out there, and it is also more.
more difficult. The amount of times that since March of 2021 that I have read online, Christianity being described as Christofascism mm -hmm. is now constant and I see it everywhere. So that, you know, it is the only story being told is residential schools. It is a very simple, single story and all the other stories are not out there. So it, it is, it is very difficult. Yeah, it's a new challenging environment yeah. compared to a time when the legacy of that shadow establishment meant that Christians could expect uh, a hearing, right? Where churches could expect a hearing. Now you have to earn it or you have to find it by making coalitions, right? Or by finding partners, by finding receptive and willing voices. But it's harder work. It's not just a default. They will listen to us because we're Christians. Yeah. We're going to take a break. Uh, so we can talk amongst ourselves. You can grab a beer, a, a, a few more snacks, and so on. Um, and then I'd love to come back and we can invite two more folks up here to talk about the future, to talk about where we're going, uh, to talk about new directions uh, and new things we, uh, we have learned or may still need to learn about faith-based public justice advocacy. So thanks very much. We're going to have these people uh, rejoin us, but we're going to have two more join us. So take a couple minutes. Uh,